Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, June 11th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris, and Katie Wu here with you on this episode. We dig into the Athletics 2024 MLB Player Survey. I know what a lot of writers think. I know what a lot of analysts think. I love to know what the players think because they see it kind of differently than we do sometimes. We're going to dig into some of the more interesting responses to the questions from that survey. Before we dig in, Katie, how's it going for you on this Tuesday? Thanks for joining us. I would like to thank you guys, one, for letting me pop in here, but two, for reminding me what day of the week it is. <laughs> I have no idea anymore. We have reached the part of the season. I always say this from June 1st to the trade deadline. Every single day is the same. So, <laughs> And we're starting a, a series today, which makes me feel like it's a Monday, but it's really a Tuesday, allegedly. So thank you for that. I have a little bit more semblance <laughs> of where I am today. Yeah, I think I'm doing the same thing for Eno, too. I think Eno needs me to just tell him what day it is because it's been a bit of a slog for him <laughs> over the weekend and getting into the new week, coming off of the illness and then being solo in the mornings, too. That's I, had, I heard Jesse Agler on, on Padres Radio. Uh, he, he said he guessed what day it was, and he said it was because it was a day game. It had to be, you know, one of two things. <laughs> so it's either a Sunday or a Wednesday. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, some teams really are pretty consistent schedule-wise in that regard. Uh, by the way, if you haven't joined our Discord, you can do that using the link in the show description. A lot of conversation happening there, fantasy and otherwise. Let's begin with this survey. And this is a, an anonymous player poll. Our beat writers, Katie included, all checked in with players during spring training, asking them questions about their peers. And this is wild because there's some stuff in there that's not surprising, right? The best player question. Shohei Otani in a runaway had it. And Ronald Acuna Jr. was the closest runner up. And that was back during spring training when Acuna was healthy. And we were all in awe of the season he just had in 2023. Um, the takeaways for me on best player that were more interesting were the others receiving votes. The players that did get a mention from someone else, someone in the league who thought they were worthy of being mentioned there. I think Gunnar Henderson was the most surprising name I saw. Not because I don't think he deserves it, but because he's there so quickly. I, I almost wondered if Gunnar Henderson somehow has become one of the more underrated top prospects to come up and play really well really fast in recent years and we're kind of obsessed with players having immediate success and what he's doing is happening a little bit under the radar outside of you know fantasy circles and of course outside of Baltimore so uh, I'm curious if either of you saw any names either Henderson or otherwise out of the others receiving votes and thought oh that's interesting I didn't think that player necessarily had a case that group included Bryce Harper Jose Ramirez, Adley Rutschman, Corey Seager, and Zach Wheeler. So Gunnar Henderson surprised me. The Orioles came to St. Louis in early May, and, you know, I don't keep up with a ton of American League baseball. I don't watch a lot of it. I'm primarily focused on the National League, but obviously you're aware of who Gunnar Henderson is. And watching him play for three days, I was just kind of in awe of the, the range at shortstop, what he could do at the plate, and I was like, this kid is – I don't think – baseball is talking about him enough. And I wondered if he was on a bigger market team, would he be a bigger star? Because he is legit. He is, I was just in awe the whole time. Um, so I was glad to see his name on there. I was like, am I being dramatic about this guy? Is he as good as I think he is? Cause my eye test is telling me he's pretty solid. So to see him up there, I was like, Oh, that's encouraging. Um, I was also glad to see Jose Ramirez getting some love. Um, we talk a lot about like, the top quality third basemen in baseball. You think Manny Machado, Nolan Arenado, and I'm guilty of this as well. I always leave Jose Ramirez off that list when he deserves to be on there uh, just as much as those other two. So um, those two, I was surprised in a good way to see, but I will say when I asked this question to my group of players, um, I did preface it with, this might be the dumbest question that I'll ask you. And keep in mind, guys, the bar is low. The bar is low for me. Um, I said, who's, who's the best player in baseball? And almost every single one of them rolled their eyes. I was like, seriously, that's how we're starting this? And I was like, it's going to get better. The questions get better. Um, but it was like over overwhelmingly Otani. Yeah, I, I guess I was a little surprised that Mike Trout was still on the list so high. Um I don't know. It's uh, it's one of those things where it's almost emeritus. 
Mm. <laughs> he gets it. He gets it for work uh, in the past rather than uh, right now. Or they're saying like once he is on the field, he's still the best player in baseball, um, which is is still a passable idea. But I think you know he's going to drop further and further on that list in, in coming lists, and uh, it's going to be hard to take Otani off the top for a while because next year he's going to probably pitch again. And so even if his bat takes any step back, uh, you're going to be adding the two together. Uh, we may change the question, I feel like, next year to who is the best player in baseball other than Shohei Otani? <laughs> and then we'll have some brave soul come back and say, I don't think Otani's the best player. And that will be <laughs> in the notable blurb underneath the question. Exactly. But yeah, the only other takeaway I had was the you know, Otani versus Acuna as the top two is the defense doesn't really seem to matter or resonate as far as being the best player in baseball in the eyes of the league, which is a little bit of a surprise. Um, Gunner is a good defender, of course. So some. I mean, Adley Russian being that. being on the list, I think it, you know speaks to it a little bit. You don't really have um, any first baseman on this list. No, uh, no, you know, Shohei. I think that Shohei also gets a little credit for pitching, even when he's not pitching. Right, because people know he can do it, and he will. Right. He's a DH do it again. without the ability to pitch. Doing this, there might have been more of a split at the top. I would. Agree yeah, but with that. I mean, he's not pitching, but everyone's seen just how elite that is. So he gets right. the benefit of the doubt. Like, yeah, he's not pitching this year, but uh, he's he pitched will. plenty of years before, and he's going to pitch again. So still the best player. Yeah, right. Like Mike Trout's not the best player in baseball this year. But we've seen what he can do when he's on the field. He can still be the best player in baseball. So that's, you know, I think that's that's why Otani got credit for pitching, even though, yeah, you're right. I thought it was interesting that only one pitcher got a mention, and it was Zach Wheeler. It wasn't Garrett Cole. <laughs> Is pitching, like, does that have to be split out in the future? I mean, I realize Otani breaks that question anyway, but should we have a separate so. question you know, next year? The position players are really obsessed with this. And even pitchers you know, agree to it often is the, the idea of posting every day. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's no pitcher that posts every day, at least in the game. Um, they're doing a lot of work and they face as many batters as batters face, you know, at the plate. You know, the, there's many plate appearances affected by a starting pitcher. So they should be theoretically as valuable. But there's something about, you know, Baseball, and we're going to get to this later. 162 games, really. <laughs> it long. matters. It matters, you know, guys. Having a guy be out there every day. Usually, your leader is a position player. You know, in the clubhouse, usually your best player. That's why the Cy is important to split from the MVP. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think that's that to me is the nudge towards maybe having the who's the best pitcher in the game question. And if that were the case, I think Zach Wheeler would have won. Potentially because he got a vote in this. And I think we'd get question. a lot of if we did split that out. Obviously, we didn't get a coal vote. If we did split out the pitch pitcher, my guess would be we'd have a lot of recency bias. Mm -hmm. um, and there wouldn't be as much credit for years past. And it would be like, you know, who's the best pitcher right now? It'd be a lot of like the best pitcher this year as opposed to like over the last five years. That's like the yeah. pitching discourse in general, though. I mean, were we talking about Ranger Suarez ever before this year? No, just in passing. Like, oh, yeah, he could be a guy. And now he's fantastic. Um, oh, and now I'm getting like death threats for like not having him in my top 10. <laughs> See, exactly. And and it's like who who would have thought not to discredit Ranger at all, but who would have thought he'd be like the leader in the National League for the best starter um, and guys that have, you know, look at Al Manoa, but like, for just an example, first guy that came to mind, like we were really high on him a couple of years ago and now it's been a really unfortunate fall. So I think player or pitchers over players always play into that recency bias a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alec Manoa mic'd up during the all-star game a couple summers ago was like one of the more fun all-star game moments of mm -hmm. recent years. And it's been a bumpy couple of years in the time since then, but yeah, it changes fast. Pitchers just, they, they burn so bright, but they burn out very quickly in many cases. So I think that'd be a constantly moving target. You wouldn't have the, the, the career achievement award type players getting that sort of recognition. If you split it down to who's the best pitcher in the game, because I think there is more of an immediacy to that question. The next question, and I think it's maybe the most interesting question in the entire survey is who is the most overrated player in the game? I didn't think there'd be a clear cut winner in this one, but Jazz Chisholm Jr. got over 20 percent of the votes. And the other names on the list make a lot of sense for a variety of different reasons. Anthony Rendon came in second. 
big contract. He's been hurt. I get that. Carlos Correa had a couple of big contracts as well. Gets a lot of attention. Maybe hasn't performed at the level There's we've also expected. Some Astros hate still yeah. probably yeah. For always Correa Astros hate. Yeah, yeah. You look a little further down the list. Alex Bregman got a mention. He at least made the chart as far as being a top ten in the overrated question. Uh, Tim Anderson pops on there. Jack Flaherty actually ended up on there. Pete Alonso, Cody Bellinger, Ellie De La Cruz from the uh, younger players bucket as well, and then Manny Machado and Blake Snell uh, rounding this one out. I think this is kind of interesting though because, all right. So like, what what do they not like about Jazz Chisholm Jr. internally? Katie, like I look at Jazz Chisholm and I think he's a good player. I don't think I've ever thought he was a superstar. And I don't really know anybody who thought he was going to get to that level. He's an infielder turned center fielder. So he's made a defensive adjustment and he's had a lot of injuries too. So I just, that that one kind of caught me off guard a little bit as a kind of clear pick from 20% of the people that participated. I'm not surprised to see his name on the list. I just, I'm surprised he's first. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I think Jazz has always been a little bit polarizing because of how he plays the game, which I personally have no problem with, but this is not a survey about how I feel. This is a survey about how MLB players feel. Um, He's flashy, right? And he plays for a lower market club. I I can't really, personally, I don't think you can pay me to watch Miami Marlins game right now. Um, And I think it's the way that he acts without necessarily having the performative stats to back it up. There's still some of that like old guard rule. Like you can have Acuna do what he does because he's Acuna, Mm -hmm. where I think like there's a standard that players for whatever reason feel like Jazz hasn't hit yet. Um, I mean, I've I've watched Marlins games, obviously. And I think Jazz is a good player. Um, But I think the MLB players believe that there's like a certain standard and he acts like he's above where he really is. I to me, whatever play the game however you want to play. But it was interesting to me that he had so like he had the bulk of the votes um, because this also was a question like at least in my opinion that a lot of guys didn't want to answer. They were like, no, like that's tough. You know, I this is a hard game. You know, we don't really necessarily put someone under the bus. Um, but when I'm going through the names, it seems to me like that's the overwhelming theme. It's a lot of guys that are good players, but have they lived up to their own hype and how do they act like? Do they promote their own hype more than they should based on how they played, how they performed? So that's what I think the the concern there is for, or the reason, the the rationale is for there for for Jazz. Yeah, it's a it, it's a tough one. I mean, you know, some of this it feels like uh, you know he's an uppity young black man. You know, <laughs> there's I, I would I, I just I, I'm sorry to see like any sort of uh, racial undertones here, but. You know, there are a lot of white people on this list, too. So it's not it's not just that. But there's something about how, you know, you know, they say in other parts of this survey, oh, we're totally cool with, you know, the celebrations. Right. And then they pick as the number one guy, a guy who celebrates, you know, the number one overrated guy is a guy who celebrates. But no, I'm cool with celebrations. You know, like it's a little bit uh, it's kind of like speaking out of two corners of your mouth mm-hmm. uh, kind of deal. Um, I also just the question is 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 a tough one, and I I this is going to come up a couple times for me, and it's not I'm not critiquing the athletic, I'm not critiquing the the questions that, or the people that came up with them. There's always there's just an inherent like I'm a psychology major, and and, and we often studied the test, the questions themselves, and what was the psychology of the question, and when you ask a question like this without providing the framework, then you're not then you're just leaving them to kind of sift through personal experience. Oh, he celebrated a lot that one time, but you know, I looked at his stats and he was hitting 206. You know, it's like, you know, you, when you don't tell them what the rating is, you know, you're asking what's underrated, overrated, but you're not telling them what the rating is. Um, I think that on the rundown, I'm, I'm sorry to steal this from you, but you said, is it because he was on the cover of, of, you know, MLB the show? Right. Is it jealousy? Is it like there's, there's extra, push on him from marketing perspective to try and grow baseball. I, I, I guess I, are players really that jealous about it? There's only one person on the cover of that game every year. So the other players on the cover didn't all get votes. They didn't so. put Vladdy. They didn't put Vladdy on this list. I don't think, although he got one vote. There's a lot of people who got one vote. Like mm-hmm. you're on Alvarez got a vote. And I'm just like, what are you thinking? That was my yeah, next question that one's for both weird. of you. Because when might I was be panicking underrated that list, if there's a if there's a rated aspect. Julio Rodriguez there, really? 
Juan They're, Soto? Who's overrated? Who's underrated? How's Jordan Alvarez overrated? Uh, like, he doesn't have any national ad campaigns. He's never been on the cover of MLB The Show. Like, do uh, – unless people are saying – even if people said he was the best hitter in baseball, I wouldn't say he was overrated. I mean, that's yeah. – I think he's in the conversation for the top three hitters in baseball. I mean, he's huge, has power to all fields, a great eye, and makes contact. I mean, it's just Let's- weird for me. Some of these make sense. Like you knew Rendon was going to be up there just because he's so but polarizing. But who rates him highly? Right. Yeah, but that's we the all thing. agree that that's nobody likes him. So yeah, was it who's we think? overrated, or like who do we not like the most, or like that's it? It's a popularity thing. I thought this it's, was like yeah. who are you tired of hearing about the most? Yeah. That's yeah. where I think like there could be some mix up. Like who are what player are you so tired about, or so tired of hearing about? Who who are you just so over when you like? Go on Twitter or you open up your athletic app because every MLB player subscribes to the athletic, obviously. That actually which name, makes sense for Pete right, like Which name are you like don't want to see? He's in the big market and they're talking about extensions and who who will trade for Pete Alonzo. Like, I don't think everyone's saying Pete Alonzo is like the best hitter in baseball. So if they, maybe he's on MLB Network, they you know that's on a lot, right? Isn't it that is. always and on? Every clubhouse MLB Network is on. So, so they're talking maybe it's about- just like, who are you tired of? Yeah, so if they're talking about Pete Alonso extensions or Pete Alonso trade offers or whatever, then maybe they're just like, why are they talking about Pete Alonso again? You know, he's totally overrated. <laughs> I wonder how many of these guys were like watching MLB Network before they did the survey and like just saw an interview and like, why are they talking about this guy? And then just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that kind of recency bias. Yeah, I need I need to get on MLB Network and more again. <laughs> just yeah, get on there. <laughs> I keep looking at this and the quote, there's a quote in the survey, someone talking about Juan Soto and I'm wondering who this player is. <laughs> this could is be a spite pick, to be honest. I feel like all he does is walk and hit singles and he doesn't hit for power like he's portrayed. Also not a good fielder. Okay, I'll agree with the very last part. Yeah, he's not a sure. good fielder, but we are talking about a player. Juan Soto, much like Yaron Alvarez, is an elite hitter. Right. If you look at the last four seasons, start from 2021 through today, sort by WRC plus Aaron Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Mike Trout, Juan Soto, Shohei Otani. That's your top five. Those are your five best hitters in baseball by that particular metric. So the all he does is hit singles. Uh, He's tied for 12th, actually, in home runs during that same span. He's got 108. So, no, it's not all he does is hit singles. I. I don't understand where that one came from at all. I don't understand where the Yarn Alvarez one came from at all because those guys seem very appropriately rated. And I think, as Eno said, Yarn Alvarez almost feels a little overlooked by some folks because they've had other stars on that team. They had other guys in that core that came up and were winning before he got there. And, you know, the Bregman Astros and the Altuve Astros and the Correa Astros and the Springer Astros, like, those are all the guys you think of first. I think Alvarez and Kyle Tucker, to an extent, are almost underrated in the national conversations. I bet you some of this is how much the other players pay. Some of them pay. That's one thing that players are really well aware of is how much other players are paid. It's it's publicly available in a way that is actually kind of surprising. That's not a lot of other industries where, like, you know, you can go and like, let me see all the CEOs that are paid in tech, you know. Uh, but, uh, if, if you think about it that way, then I think you get a little bit more juice out of, you know, um, you know, the Korea big contract, like you said, and, and the Bregman big contract and the Manny Machado big contract. It's not, it, it, it's a little slightly different reasons for everyone, you know, because, you know, some of these guys dem- are very demonstrative on the field and some aren't, you know? So it's, it's, uh, that's a, that's, I think that's, there's a little bit of a failure in the question, but I- I- if you ask it's one of those things that gets asked all the time, overrated, underrated. And it's just, there's who's doing the rating. It's also a mean word in general, right? Yeah. Like, yeah you could say someone's overrated and not actually say they're bad, but it implies that you don't think they're that good. Like, they're yeah. just, <laughs> it, it's like the easiest way to start a fight. Yeah. Right. Oh, I my God. This band, I think U2 is overrated. People are like, DVR, you don't like U2? Like, I, didn't oh, say I think that. they're fine. <laughs> I, I just don't think they're a top five band. I don't want to fight anybody. Like, it's, just, it's things like that, right? People just have an immediate reaction to it. Oh so, yeah, my god, the- that's me with War on Drugs, dude. Oh my god, <laughs> it's just like it's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's move on to this next prompt. If this was a good way to present this, Anthony Rendon was right. 
the season <laughs> is too long. <laughs> and I thought, okay, like that, that's a fair statement. Like, I, where, where, do no, this is stand? one where I have a problem with the question again. I like I had, to be fair, you know, I had a lot of problems with the questions. And again, you know, everyone, I don't want to slight anyone, but yeah. I did preface almost every interview with, I did not write these questions, but I'm going <laughs> to read them to you. So when I, when I ask you these, like, again, the bar is low. We, we know this, but like, I personally did not come up with these questions. It's a, I mean, it's because, a bad question because don't they don't it, like Anthony Rendon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're <laughs> baiting the them. Answer. You're baiting them. You're not going to answer based on the season. Around. You're going to answer based on how you feel about Anthony Rendon. You're going to be like, oh, the, I can't stand that guy. Get out of here. Like, he was on the overrated list. You know? right. like, they didn't know that when they asked the overrated question, though. That's. But, I just yeah. still think you just didn't I, I, like. I think a, a better a, a question might be multiple choice, although there, there more you wouldn't get as many sort of interesting answers, maybe. Mm-hmm. But like, what's an ideal length of the season? No, yeah. right. And then that's just, the, and maybe even give them context because obviously some of them didn't know it used to be one fifty four. Right. I know. I you promise you, there. the majority of like the young players did not know it's one fifty four. I mean, there's even one. A lot of the guys think it's one sixty still, and I'm like, it's it's actually never been one sixty. Um, but okay. <laughs> They don't even know what it is now. No, they don't even yeah. know. <laughs> because because they're like you. They don't know what day it is. They just keep playing. Yeah, we just show up. Every day we just show up. <laughs> show up. You look at the board. Are you in the lineup? Yep, I'm playing today. Got it. But there's one That's question good. there. We've been doing this for 150 years. And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no <we're close. laughs> 154 for like half of the baseball's existence. I don't know. 154 is, is actually kind of an entertaining idea for me. Because it's a little bit closer to Japan where like you get – you can almost just have one off day a week. Like these are people. They should have a weekend. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, I know it's one day weekend, but like they should have a weekend. They should have one day that they can put their feet up and know it. I think it would be good for pitcher injuries. It I would give you a chance to know. reset a lot, especially with your relievers, right? You'd, you'd have that oh, natural break built in where get back to off, backs yeah. and three in a rows would, you know, you at least have something right there on the schedule that you could look forward to. I wonder if teams would actually push a little harder on some guys knowing that they have that built in off day, though. But that's part of oh, the yeah. game, you guys. That's part of the game, not to be, again, the. 75 year old get off my lawn kind of guy but look it's 162 that's what what i think of when i think of katie yeah yeah thank you um it's i'm a traditionalist i don't like change i can admit that i have been wrong before barely but i have been wrong um but it's just what 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 makes baseball special i think and what really earns the respect from other players and i think we saw some of the answers in this was that it's 162. It's a grind. You're exhausted by like July and surprise, you still have two more months to go. And it Mm. builds up a lot of respect. Also like bullpen management, how you rest your relievers, how you rest your starters, how you rest everyone. That's part of the game too. Um, Do I think spring training is a little long? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. But we're also seeing like take Blake Snell, for example, he didn't have a full spring. Jordan Montgomery didn't have a full spring. So it's maybe necessary for pitchers. But there's Um, there's numbers between zero spring training. Sure. Yeah. You you can't go zero and six and then call it even. Um, So I think if we're going to cut something off the season, maybe we don't need seven weeks of spring training. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't know. I'm, I'm on team 162. So. Well, I like the, 154, but in Japan, I think they take Sundays off, which makes that would not make sense in America. No, so if you're gonna take if you're gonna take a day off, give me Saturday, because you can do a lot of damage on a one day weekend. Trust me, you can, but <laughs> I, that can't be a Sunday. Uh, I was thinking with my uh, pocketbook, and I was gonna say like Tuesdays, because I know personally <laughs> Thursdays. <laughs> Thursdays. But I know, like, if you go to games, I, especially if you go to games in Oakland. You know that Tuesdays are the least attended days. Yeah, that's fair. I guess no no sports league is ever going to be like, you know what? We're not going to play on Saturdays. It would make my life better. But I, no, <laughs> I would love to go to a concert Friday night. Or, <laughs> the the best you're going to do, dream. you're going to get Thursdays. That's like the most like work-friendly day off you could ever get. And I think you're more likely to get Monday or Tuesday. That's that's yeah. the way it would go. Thirty-one point six percent still agreed, despite being on the same side as Anthony Rendon. So that makes me think that the answer might be closer to fifty-fifty if they were just prompted without <laughs> Anthony Rendon's name <laughs> as part of it. I want to know who the sicko was that wanted to make the season longer. <laughs> yeah, that... yeah, exile them. They're gone. <laughs> who wants not, to play a two hundred game season? Enough. Like all, of all the players in the league and all the players you've covered. 
who can you imagine being the player that would say make the season longer and be serious about it too? It wasn't him. It wasn't him, but Nolan Arnato for sure. Dude would play every <laughs> single day for the rest of his life if he could. No, I, I, one thing that was also uh, interesting to me was the, the one answer about pay, but um, I would just, I would take that as a part from it, you know? Yes, they get, they see, they get paid in, sort of per game increments but it doesn't you could just divide the same salary over fewer games yeah right. per <laughs> game rate would just go up i, I think that's very reasonable. math not math. like math is hard best, <laughs> best <laughs> foot for a lot of players <laughs> <laughs> all right so the next question i thought was pretty interesting was where would you want to play in a vacuum, which team would you sign with if contracts state taxes and rosters were not a factor which to me is another way of almost asking where are you from or where would you like to live? <laughs> like or both of those questions simultaneously, right? It's, it's kind of like, well, they're not that. a lot of players from LA. So LA is a, LA and New York get a little bit of that. I'd love to live in LA or New York. you know? Right. I mean, if you've got money, I think they're fantastic places to live, but uh, Atlanta came away as the winner, which I thought was kind of interesting, but also speaks to a lot of players probably growing up in the Southeast. Right. And mm. Atlanta's footprint is big because of, you know, the Marlins and Rays being relatively new franchises and not a lot of other teams in that region, right? We've talked about Nashville and Charlotte as expansion opportunities for a long time, but that whole corner of the country can largely be Braves fans. So if you think about where big league players born in America come from, a large concentration of them come from the area that would be the Braves main geographic fan base. I think that that to me fully explained why Atlanta came out on top of that question. Yeah, that would make sense because I, when I was reading this question, just from personal opinion, I looked at it like, where would I most want to live mm -hmm. with a team that, you know, performs relatively well. Um, and I was looking at Southern California and that's, it's not because I'm from California. Okay. But maybe it is inherently, maybe I don't know. Um, because it just San seems Diego's like, pretty sweet. yeah, who doesn't <laughs> want to live in San Diego? Who yeah. doesn't say, are you kidding me? Um, especially if taxes aren't like a factor in this. If you can live in San Diego without the California taxes, I'm there. Just the just worst tell me when. day in San Diego is like 57 and foggy. Yeah, it's beautiful. And guess what? You still have the beach, so everything's yeah. fine. <laughs> the beach isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't. I was actually a little bit surprised to see Texas until DVR's theory of where are they from? Because obviously Texas is like a powerhouse and churning out there was also, baseball talent. So I think a comment that um, they like the stadium. Yeah. And that made really? me think that, you know, playing in the stadium, the facilities within the stadium, the field, how it feels to actually be on the field and play there is a lot different than the aesthetics of what the stadium looks like from the outside. Like you have to think about the yeah. way players experience a stadium compared to the way fans do. They come in a bus with their headphones on. They're not like looking at it. They're not looking at overhead at shots of these things. No, no. So I think that's one of those things. Well, yeah, it's a new ballpark and it probably has fantastic amenities for the players. I haven't taken a tour of it, but I would assume that's a, a big part of it too. But it was surprising given how much that stadium got ripped on by the mm -hmm. baseball media for its resemblance to a Costco and its exterior <laughs> yeah. that players, at least one player pointed out as a really nice, like beautiful ballpark to play in. You know, so seen in that light, the Cubs, uh, you know, Wrigley and Fenway being at the top makes sense from a, like standing on the field and enjoying the, the history of the place and, you know, how it looks. But from what I gather, it's not that those aren't great places to train and, you know, the clubhouses aren't necessarily that nice because it's a really old building and you're kind of stuck with old footprints. Yeah, your facilities are really limited. I mean, I can only speak to the visiting side of both of those stadiums, but those are the two smallest visiting clubhouses I've been in and it's not close. Um, like when you go into Wrigley Field, and I love Wrigley Field, it's like probably my favorite, uh, favorite ballpark in baseball, but you go up what can only be described as 8,000 stairs to get to the clubhouse. And then if you're a player, you got to go down those same stairs into like the tiniest batting cages. I don't even know where the weight room is because I can't see it because the hallway is so narrow. Um, I've had to do like recordings 
next to the bathroom because that's the only place you can stand where there's like room. It's just not an ideal training purpose. So I, I would imagine the home side's a little bit better, um, but you used to go to stadiums like Detroit and that was a really nice visiting team setup. Um, mm. So yeah, maybe that does play into it. But I will say one team that I, or one city that I was, not city, one organization I was surprised to not see on here, given how much I hear about how everyone wants to play in St. Louis, was the Cardinals who got one vote. One vote. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe this is not the baseball mecca that ownership claims that it is because every year I, I get, you know, players want to come to St. Louis and maybe they did. But if you're basing this just on like logistics, I don't know anyone that really wants to come to Missouri for fun. And I think that list uh, pretty much reflected that. If you, I know it says rosters are not a factor, but look at this through the lens of winning percentage over the last five years. Yep. And uh, a lot of good teams are at the top. I don't know. I just think it, it's like that thing where people talk about chemistry. Uh, winning solves chemistry. You know, mm. It's like there's a certain amount of these the places are going to look nicer, you know, because, you know, those teams are winning. And I don't know. Like, I know that you're supposed to take that out of it, but I, 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 I kind of feel like some of these places, like if we just come off of the Giants winning, you know, those three World Series. Yeah, there's, there's some bias cooked in there. I think. And we did tell them, don't worry about rosters. Do you think the Giants would be a little bit higher? Maybe. Probably. Yeah. There's also a connection to one of their questions that was in this. It's uh, about you know a bad organization. Like, which organizations have bad reputations among Ooh. players? This is the list you really don't want to be on because there's an extra cost to it, right? If you are a team that's on this list and you're trying to get better in free agency and you have players with similar offers to go to your team or go to a competitor, well, this might be the thing that kind of breaks you in the end, right? The A's, not surprisingly, were the runaway winner. They had 40 votes out of 79 responses, so more than half. The White Sox were second, Angels third, Rockies fourth. Then you get the Mets up there in the top five. And then Pirates, Marlins, Rays, Padres, Yankees, Nationals, Royals, all receiving multiple votes. I mean, Yankees, I saw that one of the comments was, they have a lot of rules, so... I guess it just depends on that's on someone with facial hair. Yeah, someone with a beard. <laughs> someone didn't want to shave, so they decided to put, give the Yankees the the bad reputation. But what's interesting for me is when I look at that group, there are player development questions in those top four, especially the A's, the White Sox, the Angels, and the Rockies. A lot of questions about whether or not you could go there and get better, and that that's not the only factor that would have been considered for a question like this. It's you know, do they pay players? What's the stadium like? It's it's a little bit of a catch-all, but you really are fighting against the current when players don't want to play in your organization. Yeah, if I was gonna pick like the four teams who would top out on this list, I would have picked those, I would have chosen those exact four in that exact order. This to me wasn't really a surprise to see Oakland running away. I think like it was similar to the Otani question or yeah. the who's the best player question, right? Um, and the White Sox, I mean, especially given their dysfunction over the last two years, and uh, this is before their disastrous 2024 season start, right? Because most of these things took place during spring training. So those two just kind of based off their prior history made a lot of sense. The Rockies haven't been good in literally forever. Um, and the Angels, no matter, despite having two of the best baseball players to ever grace this planet, had more dysfunction than I've ever seen in an organization. So to me, this is kind of like no surprises here. This top four uh, has rightfully earned their place. Yeah, there's some good comments that, that point to stuff that's that's really important. I mean, uh, Sacramento for three years, I've been to that ballpark before. They can't find something better. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be rough. And in fact, it might be so rough. I've heard the word contraction uh, bandied about. I don't think that that would ever come around but do you remember the whole expos thing where like baseball bought the expos like maybe there's a there's an outcome here where baseball buys the a's and figure something out for them you know because uh the team that's the, the, the leadership team that there is just really seems to be screwing up there's definitely a um a player development thing on the angels uh i've heard they treat their minor leaguers like crap 
um, and uh, uh, the organization is just pretty poorly run and pretty cheap. That is the organization that didn't pay any of their minor leaguers or mm-hmm. any of their coaches, their whole player development staff, any money during COVID sh- shutdowns. They were, uh, I think, the only one that was that severe in just cutting off their entire minor league system um, the way that they did. And so, um, who does that? Who does that in the middle of a pandemic when you're like a? Uh, never mind. I just when it when it does. This is the cost yeah, of doing do that. It. Yeah. This is the right. cost of doing that. And so what it does is it puts you in the market of having to overpay. That happens for a all lot. Of your free agents. That organization. Yeah. And then people will only take only go to you know Anaheim if they can't get an equal deal somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's been kind of the case, even on the level of like a Tyler Anderson who didn't get a huge deal, but he probably got a much better deal from the Angels than he got from somewhere else because otherwise he probably would have gone somewhere else. Yeah, I think Sam Blum had a story about the Angels last month about how all the Angels have a bunch of veterans who thought their careers were over. But hey, no, we'll go play for for Anaheim because they'll give us a spot. That's the last, that's pretty much how last the Angels do. Loon. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay, it's it's an offer. I think that's how the Angels. That should be their little slogan. We're here. It's a baseball team. It's. I, I thought again. Uh, I know I'm I'm local here. San Francisco Giants got one uh, mention, maybe. Um, uh, you know they've they've talked a lot here uh, that taxes um, are a big part of it. So I wonder if it's like this organization has a good reputation. They like the park. You know, it seems like a good place. They they want to win. They're spending money, um, but it's maybe it's just mostly taxes. I mean that's that was Brian Sabian's idea was that it was hard to land the biggest free agents because of California state taxes. So you also well, have I, to convince people that aren't from California or from the Bay Area like you and I that. Um, it's not as bad as people make it seem. I mean, Logan look, Webb has been doing a good job of like, good for him. Like, Local guy. it's fine here, dude. They're like, it's I don't know fine. what you're talking about. I mean, there's certainly just like every other city is streets you would like to avoid and you need to be aware. But like, I mean, I'm like that in every city I go to. San Francisco is still beautiful. It's still gorgeous. It's not the like crime infested city and that is sinking in trash that it's sometimes portrayed to be. Oh, that yeah. is. But you know, good luck explaining that to people or baseball players who are not from the area because they're not they're not going to believe you. So I mean, that's I, also I love San Francisco. You know, ever since I came out here for school, I wanted to come back, and I've come back, and I've lived here, and I love it. But you know, one thing is true is also like when you go to LA, do you go to Skid Row? You know, like yeah. are like Dodger players like walking along Skid Row? Like, no. So, like, you know, you know where they're gonna live when they're in LA. They're not gonna go to the bad parts. Like, you know, you know where they're gonna live when they come to San Francisco. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be in the Tenderloin. No, like, they're, yeah. going to, they're going to Pack Heights. Right? <laughs> like, come on, take a picture of the Tenderloin and be like, oh, it's so bad there. Yes, yes, we do have like a toilet neighborhood. It's yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I think that's a big part of why. They they checked in on that list, and I, I agree with both of you. Been there. It's it seems like most typical cities it seems fine. The uh, the team that was in this uh, this combination of questions that kind of falls into this empty space. The Tigers were among the teams that did not receive a single vote in the where would you play, like just eliminating all factors. I thought that was kind of interesting, just because A's, Rockies, White Sox, we expect to be there. Royals make a little more sense when you consider. You know, not a lot of players come from that part of the country. It's a smaller market team, older stadium. There's a lot of like simple factors there. The Tigers do have a relatively new, beautiful ballpark, and it's a franchise with rich history. I'm just surprised they didn't pick up even a, a single vote. And I think a lot of that's perception about the city of Detroit, right? Perception doesn't mm-hmm. often match reality. They also have and, a one vote for bad reputation, so there may be a sort of player development aspect to it. And that could be like a carryover effect from the previous front office regime because it seemed like as an organization they were falling into the dead zone of not getting good enough with young talent to to rebuild, uh, not putting themselves in a position to get up and spend again. Previous uh, generations in the Illich family, you know, Mike Illich was willing to spend. We don't know if his children will spend on payroll quite the same way once they get better again. So maybe there's some questions about that that permeate that too. But uh, that's one of those teams that actually could be on the rise and I think will be more competitive for free agents eventually than you might think just based on how people responded to that question. Why don't I throw this one at you? The players were nearly split on taking a pause for the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles. And there's a lot to unpack there as far as 
you know, would you cut games? Would you start the season earlier? Would you run the season longer? How would you how would you do it logistically? Um, but there was one comment in particular from a player that I was really surprised to see. And it was, to be honest, we would be too good and we'd destroy and win everything. Talking about the U.S. <laughs> team. And I thought, really? Like, are you, are you sure? Like, I know we're good. Like, we're very good. We'd be very competitive. But destroy and win everything is a pretty big <laughs> it's a pretty big flag to put out there that's that's the most american baseball thing i've ever heard um <laughs> I, I like I'm, I'm actually kind of convinced that'd be their slogan um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they, there's another comment that kind of speaks to that where it says if the dominican fields a good roster and venezuela that'd be pretty cool um so you know there's there's the idea that no we aren't necessarily uh going to destroy uh the u.s wasn't necessarily destroying that i i think it'd be fun the wbc is, is a ton of fun um you know gold medals are are awesome like, i think you know the people that have done it for basketball i think have found it really uh rewarding and they have actually been the teams that have kind of run the gap like they've mm -hmm. I don't know. I think they've won almost every gold medal. So, um, you know, I, I think this would be competitive. It'd really, really interesting. I think the logistics are the problem. And yeah. I think you've, you hear a lot of that in terms of injuries. Um, the one comment that I that stuck out for me was, what if we did away with the All-Star game? For that year, yeah. Because I, I think it would it would effectively be the showcase of Major League Baseball talent in the middle of the summer, just on a broader stage, beyond the global stage. From from a fan and analyst perspective, I'm all for that. Yeah, you're worried about injuries, but <clears throat> we worry about injuries for the World Baseball Classic, too. Like That's always going to be a problem. You can't make that go away. So I think you open it up, let players opt in. I'd love to see every country participating have as many players as possible who want to be there and be on that roster. I think it'd be a blast to have that in the middle of the season. And uh, even, even if we did lose like eight regular season games that year, it's going to take a few weeks to do this. I think you could make that trade off for one year. Maybe that's baseball's way of floating the 154 game season and seeing what kinds of ripple effects that has. Cause there's a lot of different conversations that come up around shorting the season. And yeah, at least but, that's a, an event where you've, you've got a little more reason to try it. Well, I, I, again, I'm, I'm thinking through my wallet. I think that most of the owners think through their wallets. And so you take an eight games away from me. What are you giving me? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I would try to sell it like the London games. Be like, hey, our best players on the world stage. Yeah. You know, making baseball like a legitimate Olympic sport that people are excited to see. And then we get more fans around the world if there was a way to do it without losing that many games and maybe just starting the season a little bit earlier making the all-star break longer and and not having the all-star game now what about the money you're taking away from me all-star game city or whatever one thing we need to do is get rid of these really bunk uh this really terrible math that people do where they're like the all-star game was worth 250 million dollars to atlanta when they took it away oh. i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth anything like close to that. It's one game. And like half the people that go are from the place. You know, and they're not they're like everybody comes down. And even if 50,000 people came and got a hotel room, is that really millions and millions of dollars? And those 50 people, th th those 50,000 people that came, if you had instead had a concert where 25,000 people came, you have to think about things in terms of like choices that players, people make. It's people have a real hard time with this. You, 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 we all have limited entertainment budgets, you know? And so if somebody's going to the all-star game, that means they're not going to the the, the movie theaters for like a month, you know? So in terms of money for the city, like it's really often not as much as people think. Yeah. You're shifting a large portion of your budget to one event. Cause, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. The all-star games in my city. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll skip my vacation this year and stay home and go to the all-star game. Right. Okay. Like, I, and if you look at, you can look at tax document, like look at tax income, you know, per for those cities. And you find that it's nowhere close to the estimates that they say. So, uh, but on the other hand, like when you are the commissioner and you say, 
Dallas, Texas gets the 2026 20, All-Star game, or whatever, you want them to feel like, oh, they just gave us something really big, you know? So then when you say in 2028, we'll just won't have a, an All-Star game, then somebody's going to be mad about that. So always I just don't know. Mad. Everyone's always mad. We're all <laughs> always mad about something. <laughs> It it's is funny choice. too because we'll just slag on the All Star Game like nonstop. How terrible the All Star Game! Like, oh, what the hell? What what is this? This is so terrible. Who who likes the All Star Game? And then you take it away and be like, wait, why? How could you Where's take the away the All Star Game? game? Exactly. You can't cancel this thing that we all complain about. What are we going to complain about? We're going to complain yeah. about a competitive global tournament where the game actually gets to grow in front of audiences that don't always get to watch it. Oh, like wait, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that's the one I saw. I was like, that one would be really cool if they could figure it out. I hope so. They got a little time. 2028, only four years away. Kind Have they already the awarded the 2028 All-Star game? They've gone through 2026. Okay. It's, Usually uh, they it's announce back it at Atlanta the All-Star game, right? Five, and then it's yeah. uh, Citizens Bank in 26. And then this year they'll announce 2027, right? They do that at the All-Star game. So they have, like, they have a year to figure this out. <laughs> Sacramento. <laughs> We're bringing baseball yeah. back to Oakland for an All Star game. How, yeah, no, zero percent chance. That would be hilarious. Just like of, everybody descending on this tiny little park. The and, lies of the bathroom, like wrap around the stadium twice. Like that's the the first concern you had was the, the lines. The, <laughs> the lines of the bathroom. I wouldn't have thought about that. Could have thought about a hundred things before I would have got to that. Last question for you is, uh, this is the analytics question. Have analytics helped your career, hurt your career, or made no difference to your career? 76% said they've helped. 10.8% said no difference. 8.6% both helped and hurt. And 3.2% said hurt. I bet these bars would look a lot different if this question had been asked 10 years ago. I'd love to see how much different the response would have been in 2014 compared to 2024. But this one sort of fell in line with my expectations overall. Was there anything in the uh, the responses that, that made your ears perk up? I I, I would be interested. Did you get, uh, uh, like, I don't know if we're allowed to, did you get any, anything Me? other than helped? Yeah. Um, I got a mixed bag. Okay, so. But my, it led to my theory that, the younger, and this, I, this is just me, yes, in my own younger. little mind. Um, the younger players are really, really into this, and the older players, because um, you know, I didn't all, I didn't just do all Cardinals players, but uh, um, the Cardinals are a little bit of an older team, and I mm -hmm. feel like the older teams, like the seasoned vets, um, might have had a little harder time buying into this because it just so drastically changed the game for them and the way that they were brought up and how they trained and basically was a complete 180 from how they did their everyday job. I think the younger players grew up with this kind of stuff. So they're like, oh, yeah, I'm all in. I'm buying into all this information. Where the older players were like, I don't care about your numbers. We already discussed this. Baseball players, math, not really a good thing. Um, but I, I do think that it's been a little bit – it took a little bit more time for some of these players to come around. And now I, I'm seeing, like, the overwhelming majority is okay with it. But I can certainly understand why, like, the older veterans who have been in the game for a decade or so – we're hesitant to adopt this method when it first came out. I was also wondering if it was a sort of hit or pitcher split, because I feel like pitchers are hundred percent in for the most part, even the older school, like, you know, I take what I take from it, you know, um, whereas hitters, um, I sometimes feel like are, are questioning if most of the analytics help the pitchers. Mm. Sure. That's a good you one. Know. So, uh, that's that's one thing that I have noticed uh, hitter 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 pitcher split. And I don't I you know I, there's going to be some of that uh, coming out with a piece uh, with Jason Stark about the current run environment and some of that. Um, there's actually a little bit of truth to it. I think you know I do think that analytics favors run prevention, and so I wouldn't be surprised if most of the pitchers I talk to are like yeah you know and the younger people too and you know then you know like a season like I just talked to George Springer for like 20 minutes. And he, he is not anti-analytics. He came from the Astros. But he was saying things like, like, can we stop putting my stats, like all of our stats up on the scoreboard? Like, Isn't that weird? When I go to the ballpark and I'm looking up, I mean, it's nice for me because I can like immediately know if, if the player's doing well or not. But you get like 
their their advanced stats. I mean, the Cardinals have the breakdown of the like the horizontal break of each pitch on the scoreboard, mm. which I think is cool. For if I'm like a baseball nerd, <laughs> but like, do players want their stats immediately up on the scoreboard like that? Do you want to see what their OPS plus is or their launch angle and stuff like that, or can it be overwhelming in the heat of the moment? That's that's a good question. We had a little back and forth where he was like, just take take them all down. Like he his point was basically like, don't put my batting average up there without context because. You know, you don't know. The batting average is not telling you how good I'm doing, is basically mm-hmm. what I'm saying. You know, it's just, you know, it, you don't know how my process is. You, you also don't have the context of the league. Mm-hmm. You know, you may have people being like, 300 is good batting average. You know, it's an attainable good batting average. The people, good good people, players hit 300. Well, the league batting average is like 239 right now. So right. 300 is actually like elite. Like that's the like, there's three or four guys, you know, who do that as opposed to like, you know, it's 10 or 15. So um, he was like, you're not really getting the full. And I was like, well, I'm a nerd. Why don't you put more stuff on there? Like your OPS plus or, you know, your barrel rate or or, or stuff that that talks to that that process. And he was like, well, then it's too much. And it already is too much. Um, And so that's that encapsulates a little bit of the veteran, the hitter, you know, mindset a little bit is is how is this stuff helping me uh, hit the like 98 monarch fastball with 20 inches of ride? Yeah, the the quote that jumped out to me was the it's helped everyone. So it's made the game very hard. Everyone's better. So even though maybe I'm better, everyone around me is better. It makes it harder in a sense that that sounds makes sense. exactly what Springer was saying. Ty France said to me, the game is so hard right now. There's so, no uh, edge like it, Well, there are edges, but there's no it seems like there's no weakness to take advantage of in the player pool anymore. Like everybody is good at something or they're at least doing yeah, forget who said that th- there's no 92 with a soft breaking ball like no yeah. yeah dials turned all the way up right now and i think analytics is a big part of that studying the game in a different way and just finding ways to maximize players ability i think that's the way so that's why it's overwhelmingly i think helping people but it is i would agree with that making it much more difficult uh, we are going to go uh thank you again to katie Wu for joining us today you can find katie on twitter at katie j Wu. read her great stuff on the cardinals at the athletic the athletic.com slash rates and barrels will get you a subscription you can find eno on twitter at eno saris you can find me at derek van riper that's going to do it for this episode of rates and barrels we're back with you on wednesday thanks for listening